Good morning and welcome to the 14th meeting in 2017 of the Finance and Constitution Committee. Item 1 on our agenda is to take evidence on the Scotland Act implementation reports and I welcome to the meeting Derek Mackay, the Cabinet Secretary of Finance and Constitution. Uh, Mr Mackay is joined today by Aidan Griswood, who is the Deputy Director of Fiscal Responsibility Division of the Scottish Government. I welcome both of our witnesses to the meeting and remind our colleagues to keep our phones in the appropriate mode at the same time. And ask the Cabinet Secretary who wants to make a, a short opening statement. Uh, convener, I think because it's a technical report essentially on the implementation of powers, I'm happy to just immediately go to questions between myself and official. Okay. As you say, most of it's technical. Uh, and, the, the, and obviously, the fiscal framework that was agreed by the two governments quite deliberately left some issues unresolved over the, and to be resolved over the course of time, such as measurement of Scottish VAT, the classification of Scottish income tax payers, the establishment of a system to enable the devolution appropriately of the social security system to take place. So it would be useful to know from your Cabinet Secretary for an opener, what you, what you see as the biggest challenges yet left to resolve? Are you happy with the progress that's been made? And can you see any for difficulties or challenges that you think you should make the government the, the government aware of? I'm sure you've done that already. The committee aware of. <laughs> <laughs> uh, thanks, convener. Um, yes, uh, uh, well, I've. Uh, I mean, setting aside budget issues, which we've had debates over and determination on that, and of course there'll be ongoing debates around uh, budget priorities and policies commitments, and uh, other debates around uh, powers that we we might not have on the actual implementation uh, of uh, the acts. I mean, I've found that the levels of engagement are positive and constructive. And there is generally a willingness to resolve the technical issues from agencies, departments, eh, around what's been agreed through the Smith Commission, the fiscal framework, and the, and, and the relevant legislation. So I suppose some of the challenges around implementation, if you take Social Security, it's, it is such a huge task inheriting um, the existing uh, systems in the uh, UK government in relation to Social Security. Um, some other elements might be more straightforward, like um, air departure tax, you know, coming from a APD, where Revenue Scotland uh, are engaging. But one of the big challenges is, is the scale of some of the transfer, mainly around Social Security. And if you take, as you referenced, uh, income tax, there was the issue about classification of all Scottish rate taxpayers, which you know, I'm, I'm confident has been resolved and that there are processes uh, in place to ensure that we're identifying all, all Scottish taxpayers. That's a matter for HMRC, of course, but we, we want assurance that that's, that's being delivered. So at the practical implementation level, um, that, that's, that's the big challenge, is a safe and secure transfer of social security powers uh, to make sure we've got a system that's fit for purpose and is ensuring people are supported. And that's all been carefully planned out um, by the Communities Secretary, of course. Uh, and at a political level, when there are uh, issues, whether it's the uh, transfer of uh, resources or detailed methodology, there's officials, uh, constant dialogue and, and working groups, leading to the Joint Exchequer Committee with uh, Treasury Ministers or engagement with the Secretary of State uh, as appropriate uh, or um, for uh, Social Security specifically. Um, there is uh, a specific committee for that as well, for engagement. So my general approach is to be constructive and uh, positive in the delivery of the implementation of the powers, but the risks are around transfer, the scale of transfer and the, the understanding that there's bureaucracies and systems involved as we are designing our, our replacement uh, systems. And of course that's then aside from the other challenges that we'll face around budgetary uh, pressures and as the new powers come to the Scottish Government, that we make sure that we are, we've got people in the right place to be able to deliver those new powers. Thank you for that, Cabinet Secretary. I know that some of my colleagues will pick up on issues around Social Security, VAT and uh, you know, income tax issues and taxpayers, etc. Um, but just to deal with one of the smaller taxes in terms of the, your basket of powers, there's been a bit of speculation in the press in the last couple of few days about LBTT. I concede I've not read beyond the headlines on that, so I'm not up to date on what it's really all about. But so it would be useful to hear from you um, what, your pers what your perspective is on the LBTT situation in Scotland. I think my 
position would be as it was last time I appeared at committee and we discussed it, which is that we, we obviously make forecasts and, and it's not an exact science in setting out our forecasts. And there have been um, a economic issues, say, around the, the North East. So overall in Scotland, the number of transactions and the value of those transactions has maybe not increased as earlier uh, forecasts would suggest. Now we've had debates here and elsewhere around the levels of taxation. I mean, there's no evidence that the levels of taxation is impacting on the market. Uh, when I've looked at the composition and the structure of tax take, then it's operating similar to as before uh, LBTT, although certainly we feel that we've encouraged uh, the, uh, the, the, the end of the market in terms of first-time buyers and so on. Uh, so looking at the forecast, I mean, the figures on the public domain around forecast and outturn, and if, if you take both years together, our forecast compared to outturn for financial years 2015-16 and 2016-17 was within fif uh, £13 million of a difference, having raised £13 million less, but that's a 1% difference from our forecast to actual outturn. But I'm saying within that that, of course, forecasts are adjusted based on the best information you have at the time, and there's no doubt there's been an impact in the economy, particularly in the North East because of the oil and gas downturn, and that has affected uh, overall forecasts. But we wouldn't be the only government that says that this tax can be quite volatile and difficult to forecast. UK government would say the same, or OBR would certainly say the same. Uh, indeed, they've said in relation to uh, UK, member of the UK equivalent tax at stamp duty land tax is one of the more volatile sources of receipts. In line with that, we've revised SDLT forecast proportionately more than any other major tax. So our forecast for the two years it's been in operation has been close, as I say, within 1% of a difference. Uh, it is a volatile tax, difficult to forecast. It's easier to count what's already been received as opposed to looking ahead. Uh, and therefore, um, we reflect on all the economic determinants to, to assess uh, our forecast position. Of course, the uh, Scottish Fiscal Commission, uh, taking up the statutory function, will determine the, the models that they want to use to forecast going forward. And of course, we'll be uh, relying uh, on them uh, going forward. I hope that assists, convener. That helps us understand the Scottish position. But obviously, this is a relative exercise because it's BGA depends on what's happening north and south of the border. So wh what's, what's the up-to-date situation in the rest of the UK? In the rest of the UK, I mean, over that same period, so I've covered 2015, 16, 2016, 17, both years taken together, as I say, the forecast was £919 million. The actual outturn was £906 million. So that's a difference of £13 million, 1% of a difference between forecast and outturn. So the equivalent tax for the remainder of the UK, for SDLT, their difference is actually £2.9 billion, and that's a 22% difference they were out by. So it just makes the point, as I say, that OBR was saying that it is a more volatile source of receipt, uh, and the forecasts are just that forecast. But I think when you contrast and compare what we were able to set out by way of our forecast, an actual outturn 1% of a difference, UK government 22% of a difference, £2.9 billion, and I think it shows our forecast um, uh, we're solid now. I don't want to then speculate, does so that mean we'll always be within that range in the future? You don't know, but of course we're very reliant on these forecasts and setting out our budget uh, position. But that's the difference uh, between our forecasts and what the uh, OBR had forecast. Okay, that sets the scene, Cabinet Secretary, and other, other members interested in this area. Murdo. Thanks, Jeff. Just uh, to, to come in, just to get some, some clarity, if I can. Um, the, the note we got from our advisor suggests that the for the for the year 2016-17, uh, we're looking at LBTT liability in Scotland of 494 million. Now, the block grant adjustment figure for the, for that year, for both LBTT and uh, landfill tax, is 600 million. And so, if you add 494 and 114, you already exceed that. So I suppose the question is, do we know what's happening elsewhere in the United Kingdom for that year, 2016-17? Do you think 
that the block grant adjustment is likely to be higher or lower than the £600 million pounds quoted. Come from the so, yeah, so I, 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 if I can come in on that. So, so at the last um, budget, so you say the £600 million was a sort of a, a, a agreed figure, and then since then, um, when we get to outturn, so the, to the um, December budget had 641 for um, LBTT and landfill tax together, so that was an update at that point. Um, and then since Mar and then in March we've had obviously the, the, we've got the OBR um, um, and the actual end result stats from HMRC um, on um, SDLT, but we haven't got the block grant adjustment figure relating to that yet. So we'll get we'll get that in a few months' time, and that's something the UK government produces. Yep. And then we look at that, and then we set it alongside what would be at that point a, a more final definitive figure on our own receipts because of. Um, um, accruals and the like as well, and that's at the point where you can make the, the calculation. Um, so there was a, if you like, a, it depends how you look at it, a deterioration of the block grant position at, at the December um, um, budget, because it was 646 at that point, and then um, since then um, we'll just need to work through the numbers um, and wait till what the UK government comes forward with in terms of that final estimate at that point. No, but, but just so I understand this correctly, the, the block grant adjustment will depend upon the relative strength of collection of stamp duty land tax elsewhere in the UK. I mean, you don't have a sense as, as of now how that's looking, or is it too early to see? Um, well, we have, we, the only sense we have is that the final figures were slightly higher than the March um, budget forecasts um, by a few hundred million. Um, so. To be precise, we've got um, 11 billion 413 million was the March budget forecast, and the final out term was 11 billion 713 um, million. Um, but because of the complications of the block grant adjustment methodology, you know, we don't want to, you know, that's for the UK government to crank, crank the handle on that and confirm those figures in due course. Um, but that hopefully gives you a little bit of an indication of, of the type of variation we've seen in the last few months. Okay. Ivan, do you got any follow up on that? Yeah, just to follow up, and I understand that. So I need to say 1.4 was what the the UK government had said in the the spring budget. Is that right? Yeah, the OBR. Ah, right. right. The red book's got 11.6, but okay. Um, and the out turn you're reckon is 11.7. So for that order of magnitude, what kind of difference would that make if those numbers stood up? What kind of difference would that make to the to the BGA? Um, well, you'd have to do the. Um, so I mean, it's it's, it's um, 300 million, roughly, isn't it, over 11 or so yeah. billion. So you can get a sense of scale from that, but it's you know well under. Ah, it's um, two and a half percent or something, yeah. right? So um, that'd be a proportional impact on that 600 it, it, million, roughly. Yeah, and, and I think this is where we we, we can't be too definitive because things like those final. In sure, sure. About but it's that kind of all those sorts of things. Yeah. Yeah. So it gives you, all, it sends you a scale. It's not, it's not a huge proportionate impact. So why is that? It was somewhere between 10 and 20 million kind of number, um, whatever, right, give or take. And that would reduce the BGA then by that amount? That but would increase it. Increase the BGA. If, if all of that flowed right through. Right. But as I say, right, I think okay. it's too early to say you know, the right. scale. Okay. Yeah. OK, but as you say, the... The, 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 the outturn number you've got for the BGA is what, what you said, 640-ish? At, at the um, budget, the figure was 641 for right. SDLT and... Together. And, yeah. and, and landfill tax together. Okay. OK, OK, that's fine. Right, I would, yeah. So, over to Adam, Social Security Issues. Thank you, <coughs> Kavini. Yeah. Um, good morning, Cabinet Secretary. I wanted to ask you some questions around um, um, the uh, ongoing uh, project of um, social security devolution. And I wanted to start with a figure that the um, Minister for Social Security gave to the Parliament, I think last week in her statement uh, on the Social Security Agency, where she said that the estimated annual running costs of the Social Security Agency are £150 million. Um, uh, she wasn't able to say anything about where that figure came from or how it's composed or how it compares with the annual uh, costs of delivering social security in Scotland now. So I wondered if she could help us understand that figure a little bit more, its provenance and its uh, various component parts. Well, that would be for that portfolio to explain the individual costs of the operation of the social security system. What I will negotiate with UK government is a transfer of resources, recognising it won't cover every cost, but it's part of the fiscal framework 
uh, agreement on that transfer um, of uh, resource, uh, which, as you know, has happened incrementally over the period of this parliamentary term. So it would be for um, colleagues and communities to go into further detail about the arrangements say, for the agency and uh, expenditure. To see my engagement on, on, on this element is the implementation of the new powers to ensure that we have the transfer of resource uh, and uh, necessary functions from the UK government. I think about where that £150 million figure came from. The, the, those figures will be understood by the uh, Minister and Cabinet Secretary. As I say, I won't have the detail right now on that operation of the agency, uh, but my prime function here is to ensure there's the adequate transfer of uh, resource and, and function from UK government. Um, thank you. Um, in terms of the um, question of uh, transfer and resource, then, uh, Cabinet Secretary, a couple of questions around that. Um, in terms of um, just trying to again, just trying to understand the, the, you know, the, where, where exactly we are in this journey uh, and, and our preparedness uh, to take on responsibility for the delivery of devolved um, uh, welfare and social security benefits in a couple of years' time. So, first question on this: Have Scottish claimants um, of the devolved benefits been identified? by DWP. We know that there have been some issues around identification of Scottish taxpayers, but we also now need to identify Scottish um, uh, recipients of devolved benefits. Has that been done? Um, so again, I would need to refer you to the Cabinet Secretary on that level of detail uh, around that. That's not something I would specifically deal with. Okay. Um, so you don't know whether any data on this has been shared with the Scottish Government? I'm sure that the Cabinet Secretary and uh, Jean Freeman, the Minister, will be able to go far more detail about the arrangements, say, for uh, benefits and payments than I would be able to now. Okay. I thought you said in your answer to my first question about the 150 million that it was your responsibility to ensure the smooth transfer of resources from the UK to Scottish Government to prepare for social security devolution. And uh, these are questions about that process of transfer. Yeah, but the, the UK Government is not transferring the exact cost of administering the system. What we have is a deal around the transfer of resource. That's what's been negotiated through the Joint Exchequer Committee, right. and that's why I'm undertaking that political deal as to the transfer of uh, resources. So the lead Cabinet Secretary Minister would deal with the arrangements for Social Security in Scotland uh, and the delivery uh, of those payments. Okay. What I have engaged with is the implementation of the powers. So the resource that's transferring to us doesn't necessarily absolutely match the cost of delivering the new powers and service. That was a political deal. Right, OK. So do you think the... Um, is, it, is it your understanding that the cost of delivering the devolved powers will be greater than the cost of delivering those welfare benefits is now? Yeah, that's very possible. Yeah. Can you help us just understand the nature of the, of the additional cost? Well, we won't know the full extent of that yet, knowing that we'll be transferring something like 15% of Social Security uh, spending, 85% uh, of course remaining at Westminster. So we're taking part of system, we're taking part of payments into Scotland, creating that... Uh, those new systems and that bureaucracy to be able to uh, deliver it. So there will be an ongoing monitoring and analysis of what that will cost, and we're setting out how we want to design uh, the system, some of the principles uh, around it. And the value, of course, of transfers is £2.8 billion, but it's too early to say at this point the exact cost of the new Social Security uh, Agency as it's delivered over the uh, term. OK, but delivering that £2.8 billion worth of Social Security benefits will cost more um, after devolution than it costs at the moment before devolution. Is that, what you, is that, uh, is that, is that correct? I'd say it's quite possible because we're, we're taking parts of a system from the UK government that it will cost more than, what, what, of course, what we're spending at the moment because we're administering very few um, types of these uh, payments. So we anticipate the cost being more than what has been agreed in the fiscal framework just for so Social Security. Just help me understand this. If the, the, the mere fact of devolving these, de devolving the responsibility to deliver these benefits, uh, um, uh, has an additional cost, how does the no detriment principle apply to to that? Is that a cost that will have to be borne by the Scottish government? Well, essential, of course, we want to be as efficient uh, as possible. No detriment applies because of the, the essentially the wider deal on the fiscal framework, that there's no detriment overall to uh, expenditure in Scotland as to how we uh, use these powers. As I say, we, we could have continued the negotiation with UK government. I wasn't party to it, but uh, continued the negotiation with UK government. But we believe that we've got an adequate transfer of resources to be able to deliver 
these functions, and that's what's been agreed by the UK government. Okay. But, the, but, the, but the cost, the additional cost um, of, uh, de of delivering these social security benefits in a devolved setting over and above the cost of the way in which they're delivered now is a cost that will have to be borne by the Scottish Government. Yes, well, yeah. essentially it's a devolved function, yes, so we're paying for it. Question for me, if on this, if I may, uh, Cabinet Secretary, are we, from where you sit, um, given your um, portfolio of responsibilities, are we on course for the transfer of operational responsibilities by April 2020? Uh, all of them, from my point of view, they, I believe that the, uh, the necessary work streams are underway and there's a commitment to deliver on both uh, parts of, of government, yes. So I understand that there's a commitment to deliver, but are we on course to deliver? Uh, in my view, I've seen no information that suggests we're not. I'll take that as a yes. <laughs> the Cabinet Secretary nodded. <laughs> I'm trying to express my confidence in the engagements that we have that we're going to deliver the uh, agreement over the course of this term of Parliament in the way that we've set out, yes. Thank you. James. Uh, thanks, Convener. Just following on from that, I'm interested in the, the timelines around this. Obviously, it's been uh, transferred in terms of two tranches. So if you take tranche one, just as an example, uh, in terms of discretionary housing payments, can you maybe then just talk us through the, the, the process for transfer and the key timelines in relation to discretionary housing payments? Again, the Cabinet Secretary will be able to go into more detail on individual um, payments, powers and uh, elements uh, of that. Um, rather than myself, so I've engaged with the top level agreement around transfer of power uh, and uh, resource. So I think, I mean, if you want further uh, detail, then I would encourage you to uh, invite um, Angela Constance or indeed uh, Jean Freeman to go over the specifics. Right, I, I, sorry, I, I wasn't trying to be awkward in any way. I, I, I thought I was asking a reasonably straightforward question in the sense that the note that you've provided says tranche one was commenced on 14th of July 2016, and it gives a, a list of the sections that cover tranche one. I'm just looking for an indication, not, not an indication, a, a more specific answer is in terms of what is the process for that transfer and what are the, what are the kind of timescales? When okay. do we? Well, I'll ask Aidan Greaswood to come in with uh, detail. Yep, so spe specifically, Mr Kelly. Um, so, yeah, discretionary housing payments. So that, that takes effect and taking responsibility for that from April 2017. So some of those bespoke discretionary payments are taking effect this year. And then there's the um, a, a range of benefits um, which DWP currently administer, um, which are more complicated in terms of delivery. Um, and again, I can't, you know, I'm, I'm, um, it, it would be for um, Social Security colleagues to give more detail around this. But essentially... That requires um, um, is a much more complicated process of transition and work with DWP to ensure that those are delivered successfully by 2021. Okay, so ju just going back then to tranche one, which lists, um, just looking at it, it looks as if there's around 10 there. You said discretionary housing payments uh, have, have effectively come into effect April 2017. Are you saying that the others have got different timelines on them? Or are they April 2017 as well? Um, well, it's the, it's, it's the powers over, over doing those, isn't it? So it's discretionary payments through local authorities. So the housing payments will take effect from then, and then there's extra powers on top, on top of that and over the same time scale. Well, to give so, another yeah. example, what about, like, for example, powers to create other new benefits? You know, is that... It, it, yeah. Has the legislative transfer been affected for that? Um, it would be new legislation to provide new benefits. Right, There's okay, a social security that. bill yeah. that's coming coming right. forward that will lay this out in, in more detail. Um, but the, 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 I suppose the distinction that's been made is between, um, as you say, discretionary or new benefits that don't suffer the consequences of um, complexity of, 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 of DWP administering at the moment, and that smooth transition process. So that's why those were selected to, to right. go earlier. Okay, in terms, of these, in terms of these discretionary payments and... Uh, that the, the transfer has been made, are the, are the systems in place to allow discretion? To take again discretionary housing payments as an example. Um, uh, are, are the systems in place to allow that to go ahead? Um, well, essentially, that works through local authorities. My understanding is it works through local authorities anyway, so in a sense, it's using existing systems through discretionary housing payments. 
So just to be clear, are you saying then that at this minute in time, local authorities now have the power to make discretionary housing payments? It's about who's a, who's who's responsible for this. So it's about the um, authority being passed to the Scottish Parliament rather than UK Parliament. Yeah, but you said I, I'm not I'm not trying to be awkward. You said that local authorities had the power to make these discretionary housing payments. All I'm trying to establish is have they got the power now to do that, or is there still some work to uh, to be carried out to ensure that that happens? No. So, so they currently have the have the power and are making discretionary housing payments. It's more about the devolution of responsibility going from UK government to Scottish government and therefore the funding around that being determined from Scottish Parliament rather than UK Parliament. So is the, is the funding in place for it then? Um, yes. Okay. Um, right, just going on then, sorry convener, just going on to, to tranche two, um, which will be completed by April 2020 in terms of the executive, both the legislative and executive competence. But there's a line in there that says, thereafter, agency agreements uh, would be put in place as necessary. Does that mean that there's further work required after the, the, the executive competence has been transferred in order to uh, take effect to the, the, the sections 22 and 23? Yes, that's, that, that's my understanding. That's, that's correct. So it provides exactly the enabling powers and then judgments will be made working closely with UK government around those specific tranche two benefits as to when those would transfer, making sure that there's a smooth transition and um, the interests of benefit recipients are, are fully protected. But, it, but you've got the enabling legislation in place to... Um, you know, to, to, to give that legislative competency to the Scottish Parliament to, to make to move quickly when 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 it, it deems that you know, it's reached that point. So it's, it's fair to say that obviously there's been concern expressed that this is going to take four years, but it's actually great. It's going to be actually greater than four years by the time all the pr appropriate systems and processes are actually in place in the agency agreements. I, I think you're going into levels of detail, which is entirely appropriate and fair, but really for you know the community's portfolio, if, if you want to probe it further, I think that's fair. The, the, the detail around implementation would be for the Cabinet Secretary and Minister. So you know, I'm, I'm happy to arrange that, Convener, if you want more detail on that. I, mean, I know a statement has been given to Parliament, and we're further outlining the, the role of the Social Security Agency. Um, and we do have a range of commitments as to how we would use the new powers. But if you want more detail on that portfolio level, then that can be given. I'm not going to ask any further questions, Convener. I, 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 I would just say that uh, obviously there are concerns as to why this takes four years. I understand it's complicated, but four years seems an awful long time. And from what's been said, it's actually going to take greater than four years. So I think that is a matter of concern. No, I, I don't think we're saying that. Obviously, we want the safe and secure transfer of powers from the UK government to Scotland to ensure people get payments they're entitled to, and we have that flexibility to do things uh, differently. Uh, there are arrangements in place and being informed as to how the uh, Social Security Agency will be delivered. Then there's, of course, engagement with local government as well. My point is that if, if the committee is, is, of course, entitled to do once more of the detail around what we're proposing around the agency and payments, then uh, it's more appropriate to get that from uh, Angela Constance and, and Jean Freeman. Okay. Cabinet Secretary, Willie. Thanks very much. Cabinet Secretary, I wonder if I could just go back for a moment to the identification of Scottish taxpayers and the numbers uh, involved in that. We, we know that HMRC initially uh, failed to identify about 420,000 Scottish taxpayers and that has been resolved fairly quickly and you, you said in your opening remarks that you're confident that that's been resolved but what, could I ask just what form of assurance, what, what does it look like? Is it, is it simply reporting for, sharing between one government and the other or do you have access to the data is there data sharing going on and who's verifying the, the data on an ongoing basis that we're, we've got accurate numbers today it's fair to say that you know, we're concerned by by that uh, classification identification uh, issue it is a matter for hmrc to p provide that uh, service uh, uh, to us 
Uh, but they, they've gone through it quite methodically to, to be they are confident they've identified all Scottish rate taxpayers. Uh, there has been, my understanding is, some independent uh, work as well um, to look at that third-party um, yeah. uh, analysis to, to make sure that we're confident that's been arranged. And that, it, there's some other um, processes you can undertake, and, and we'd encourage, of course, taxpayers to, to check their code as well. Um, but we are confident from the engagement we've had through officials that they've identified uh, all Scottish rate taxpayers. Uh, we're also going to have a service level agreement to make sure that we've got um, a, an adequate level of service uh, as well. But uh, we don't believe there's you know, a, a large scale or any outstanding um, Scottish rate taxpayers that are now uh, not identified. Adrian. Yeah, it's, I mean, just, just, just to, um, to build on that, I mean, it, it's, it's, there's always movements of the tax base. Um, so there's a particular issue around the 420,000 and HMRC acted, they did a short-term fix and then they've run a, an IT system um, to, to, to um, change to, um, to, to capture those um, 420,000 taxpayers. Um, so it's all about reasonable efforts, you know, so ca how much can you reasonably capture at any one point? So I, I guess that's the point is, at this point, um, we're very assured that they're making um, reasonable efforts um, to capture um, that taxpayer um, data set. Um, it's always one that changes over time because you never know. There is no ideal out there sort of set um, for you to compare it against, hence the point about making the comparisons with third party data sets and the like. Not necessarily because the third party data sets are fuller than um, what HMRC have got, but it can, it can flag anomalies or issues um, that they can then address. So there was the big issue of the 420,000. There's issues around things like missing addresses and the like, much smaller scale that they're working through. Um, issues about postcodes here and there not being captured. So again, each of these is sort of iteration after iteration. It's a continuous improvement process. Um, and we stay very closely to that to get assurance ourselves. Um, that um, that work's being undertaken. So we have regular review meetings with HMRC to understand you know, what the current position is, what work they're, they're undertaking to improve the data set. Um, they also do, um, and we did this on our own offering, looked at, for example, the Scottish Government payroll to see whether that flags out issues that they can then address. They've also done the same with other large employers. Um, they've undertaken um, communications activity um, last year, and they're looking again at how that can fit into communications campaigns around um, the individual personal account of HMRC, which is a means of, which is something they're trying to promote, just in terms of efficiency and um, being a positive thing for um, taxpayers themselves to see um, their own tax position. But actually, rolling that out will improve because by setting up an account, you update your address. So you know the emphasis is always on. There's only so much you can go in terms of the data sets. Ultimately, people have to update their address. Um, so, you know, a challenge there around just I I ensuring that as many people do that as possible. Um, what they're also doing is developing a compliance strategy um, on the back of the um, rates that were set in the budget, um, to, which um, should be completed fairly shortly in terms of activity that will be undertaken to ensure that, again, people aren't shifting um, 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 that there isn't um, activity that would um, lead to tax avoidance. Um, so there's a, a range of measures. Um, we have regular review meetings with them. Um, we've got assurance that from that that they are taking this very seriously. There's a continuous improvement process. Um, and separately, we've got, of course, the National Audit Office and, indeed, Audit Scotland recently um, reviewing that too. And, and they've given evidence to, um, not this committee, but the, um, um, recently the... Um, um, public audit committee um, on, on progress there. Okay, we've got two papers uh, in front of us, one from yourself, Cabinet Secretary, and one from the, uh, the now former Secretary of State of Scotland. Uh, in your paper, Derek, in paragraph 41, it says... Sorry? Maybe you can come here. And you post, even if there's an election. Right. Just for clarity. Well, yeah. you get ahead yourself there, well, <laughs> On you go, Willie. Well, that's very helpful because I think we should be asking him a couple of questions, if you let me ask my question. Uh, Derek, in your paper, HMRC tell you that they have 2.6 million Scottish taxpayers identified. That's paragraph 41 in your report. 
When you look at the current Secretary of State's report on paragraph 10, he identifies that there are 2.45 million letters were issued and then 420,000 were missed. So that total is 2.85 million. That's a difference between his assessment of the number of taxpayers being 2.8 million and HMRC telling you in your paper that it's 2.6 million. That seems to me that there's still quite a big difference there in the number of identified taxpayers between the yeah, two reports. I think, I think it's yeah, we can we can come back to that with more detail uh, if, if need be. I think there's also just a difference between the 2.6, which is HMRC's understanding of how many taxpayers there are out there, and, and that's what flagged the 420 originally. There's also the further question of the extent to which um, self um, people who were flagged as being taxpayers actually ultimately paid tax because of through self-assessment, which led to a further change in the number. So I, I suspect it might be these figures. Um, been, been interpreted differently and, and relayed differently that have come to that mismatch. But we can we can certainly clarify that um, if that would be helpful, working with our UK yeah. government counterparts. We can view from where... Before we go on, uh, thanks for asking that question. I, actually, I, I don't think it's good enough to have a situation where there's different interpretations being put on the number of taxpayers we have. We need some assurance in that in Scotland mm -hmm. exactly how many taxpayers we're going to have. So I, I'm glad you raised that. I, I hadn't spotted that in the reports, really. So we need to... Maybe something we we'll have to consider following up on, because if we don't, if we haven't got a solid base to start with, and there's disagreement about what that base even is, then we've got an issue in Scotland about knowing how many taxpayers we have. Well, that's that was, just not good enough. Well, that was going to be my next question. Sorry, Wally. what is what is the total of Scottish taxpayers as we understand it, and as the Secretary of State might understand it, and perhaps can you know the committee might consider inviting the Secretary of State in to answer these same questions that we're asking our own Cabinet Secretary. What is the actual correct total? If we're dealing initially with an anomaly of 420,000, now we have two papers in front of us that have still have 270,000 of a difference. I think we need to be scrutinising this a little bit more carefully, I think. Okay. Fair, uh, convener. We both, both governments have the same source, and that's HMRC, who we pay to carry out a function. They deliver a service to us. They identify the taxpayers, um, follow through on compliance and, uh, of course, collection. Um, so we will happily engage. Um, I can't answer for UK government. Uh, there is no policy dispute here, but we can certainly explore the point. But HMRC is the same source uh, for both. And... You know, it, it may well just be a descriptor at a point in time, but you know, as I said to the earlier question, I'm satisfied HMRC have undertaken efforts to ensure that they've identified uh, Scottish taxpayers, uh, and that's who we're collecting uh, tax from. And that uh, earlier issue that had been identified in 2015 has been addressed, but we'll certainly take up the point in the narrative uh, about the, the difference in uh, position. Uh, as to the Secretary of State but being here to... Um, answer for for his report. That's of course a matter for him. Yeah. Thank you, William. I think you had some follow-up questions, Mr. Well. That's right. Just First of all, a matter arising from Mr. Coffey, uh, Mr. Greaves, would you talk about um, the income tax relying on people notifying HMRC of a change of address? Uh, and of course, the National Audit Office has said that there remains a risk that people won't update their addresses and then you get the anomalies identified. So how is that being addressed, or how are you addressing that, given that, as I understand it, there's no further spending commitment on communications to people? Um, and also, uh, how do we ensure that there is no artificial manipulation, just as you mentioned, if perhaps the tax rates diverge? Um, well, it, 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 it remains a risk, as you say, um, so it's an ongoing issue of... Um, across the piece, trying to get people to update their addresses and, and, and encourage that to happen. Um, so, as you say, there was the communication campaign previously, and, and I think the focus is now shifting towards a more generic campaign around individual accounts with HMRC, and I think that presents an opportunity, which HMRC are considering, in terms of the extent to which um, that could be intensified in Scotland in order to it sense to have a double benefit as a consequence of that campaign, both in terms of getting, encouraging people to use um, online accounts, but also through, through that process, updating their address. So that's part of it. That's a kind of um, the communications um, strategy. There's also lots of work going th through their large business unit, which is actually working directly with 
um, employers, um, so which is as a means of raising awareness of this. Um, so there's a, a link through to to that as well, um, and then. Um, there's a compliance strategy, come back into your, your last point, which I'm not liberty to say, because um, um, that hasn't been completed yet, but HMRC um, are developing a compliance strategy um, um, for Scotland um, on the back of, um, uh, yeah. Okay. Just, just to make one point, point, of course, just for clarity and understanding that the you know, tax position is based on residency, of course, um, and, and that's a major driver in where you're paying your tax. So just for awareness of committee, that's a, an important point. And when they, when they focus on compliance, that's what they'll look at. Um, issues of residency, so your point around just uh, flipping addresses. Um, clearly, HMRC we would focus on that and the evidence of where someone actually lives most of the time. I don't want to go into the detail. I don't want to describe ways in which people can avoid paying tax. Of course, you wouldn't expect me to, but residency is the key issue here. And, and I should say that the, the overall compliance strategy is that the sums at stake here in terms of tax differentials are far smaller than some of the sorts of the scale of um, issues that they normally have to face in compliance in terms of sort of very high rate taxpayers and um, you know, extremely wealthy individuals and opportunities, um, um, incentives there to potentially um, avoid tax. The, you know, the scale of those numbers are, are huge and the incentives much bigger. Um, so they tend to be more focused inevitably in terms of targeting resources on on, um, on that level, high level of compliance, rather than necessarily sort of small va variations in, in tax rates. Uh, just staying on income tax, then, the uh, HMRC running cost of the Scottish rate of income tax is one and a half million for this year. Uh, and they estimate, I think I'm right in saying, that the inc that, that running cost will increase to about five million if the Scottish rate of income tax is different to that in to the rest of the UK. Can you just explain, first of all, why that is? I mean, that's a big jump. Um, I mean, that's a maximum figure, and actually, as it as it happens, it, I mean, it depends on the scale of the change um, that they're talking about. So there's a contingency figure. Um, Next question. Uh, uh, it might be useful then. Because, uh, what I was going to go on to say is, is there some kind of de minimis on this? How different does the Scottish rate have to be to have an, uh, for, for you to incur an extra three and a half million pound in, in cost, or is it incremental? It's, it depends on the scale of the change, as you say. So if, if it was a sort of wholesale change, different bands, different rates, you know, that would be a, a whole different magnitude of potential cost and implementation. And if that was late in the day as well, so if that was sort of just before um, the financial year started, that incurs a greater cost as well because of the intensity of work that would need to be done, and they'd have to do extra extra work just to kind of work through the systems and update them, which they wouldn't necessarily do through sort of business as usual practices, as against a small change. Um, in, you know, a small change well in advance would be in very small costs. Um, you know, um, and but they essentially cost it based on, on what the policy issue is, what the difference is, and then would return to us with what the cost is. Uh -huh. Right. But, but if there is, just, just for clarity, if there is a small divergence in the rate of tax, then there will be a cost incurred, which presumably needs to be budgeted for. Yes. Yes. You know, HMRC, we pay HMRC to carry out a function they cost that in return to us, yes. Okay. Yeah, the UK government changes tax as a cost. Obviously. So, I don't think there's any great surprise in that stuff. Um, that's difficult. VAT is even more challenging, I think, from what I'm beginning to understand. Marie was going to pick up on that. Um, I wanted to ask if um, just about the methodology involved in calculating the VAT assignment now that it's going to be such an important part of our budget going forward. Um, I understand that in the past with the JERS figures an estimate was sufficiently robust but we need something a little bit more accurate and robust going forward when it's going to be such an important part of our um, spend. Well, as, as members will know that the, the agreement is not that it's actual um, spend or, or receipts uh, in Scotland. It will be just uh, that assessment, uh, an estimate that leads to the assignment uh, of the proportion um, of uh, VAT. Um, but we are still working uh, 
uh, on the methodology uh, as to how that will be applied for 2019-20. Aidan, can you maybe say where that is? Yep, so that's, that's um, quite a bit of intensive work going on between um, our analysts and HMRC analysts um, around developing that methodology. So it, it, it draws on existing work in terms of um, a regional model of, of VAT um, and, and enhancing that. Um, and part of that is basing it on survey data, so using um, expenditure surveys um, to get a feel for, you know, well, to get an assessment of what um, expenditure is in um, Scotland um, by different categories of goods um, and therefore able to drive an overall estimate of assigned um, revenues through VAT. That's been enhanced by a, a boost to that survey, so it uses a UK-wide um, survey and there's a boost that's been paid for for Scotland specifically in order to get a better sample side and that therefore helps reduce the volatility potentially of, um, well, will reduce the volatility of the number that comes, which is part and parcel of the consequence of using a survey rather than the actual data, um, mm -hmm. is you need to kind of reduce the volatility of that number. Um, so that will um, help in doing that. And then there's quite a lot of complex work involving particular sectors where there are issues such as reliefs and the like that you need to consider or um, um, particularly, for example, say the financial service sector, um, which is very complicated VAT arrangement. So there's bespoke work that's going on to um, look at all of that um, as, as well. So one of the concerns we've had in the past is that using, for example, household surveys um, and extrapolating from that might not capture the increased spend that comes from tourism in Scotland. So tourism is a significantly greater contributor to the economy up here than in the rest of the UK. And also we're, there's a lot of um, policy aims to increase tourism. So for example, if we reduce air departure tax, we would expect to see an increase in tourist numbers. And we would expect to see these people spending more money in our shops and an increased VAT take. Are we going to capture that in the new methodology? Yes, my understanding there is a specific um, bespoke piece of work around expenditure by tourists that would be used as a bolt-on to the overall expenditure. As you say, household surveys wouldn't capture that. Um, um, so it's exactly that sort of additional work that's been done to try and cover um, some of the potential um, holds in existing um, approaches that's been done. We've got more time on VAT given the timescales involved, but you know, it's quite a, quite a big task obviously, to get that comprehensive survey. And then we've also got the transition period too built into the fiscal framework. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't necessarily just all go live day one. There's um, an opportunity to have a transition period um, where VAT revenues are protected, um, but we're actually looking at the, the figures and, and understanding those and then able to come to a, a a view about the appropriate deployment of that methodology going forward. Okay, and finally, I presume that after 2019, if we Brexit along with the rest of the UK, there is an opportunity to, for VAT to be fully devolved to Scotland because it was a European law that was preventing the full devolution to Scotland. Well, there is that possibility. That wasn't something we've negotiated in the previous acts, but um, yeah, that would be that would be in the hands of. Uh, uh, UK government, but we, um, on this element on methodology, a recommendation hasn't been put to politicians yet because it's still been worked on by the officials. But the important point around capturing as, as best we can um, actual receipts in Scotland is what we want to achieve. Thank you. I asked a, a, a question in this area as well. Adam's got a specific supplementary just, just point. Just on the very last point that Marie Todd just asked you, uh, there, Cabinet Secretary, I mean, um, as I recall it, Patrick Harvey was there too, he'll correct me if I'm, if I'm wrong, but as I, as I recall it, the Smith Commission recommended um, the assignment of a share of VAT receipts in Scotland to the Scottish Government, not the devolution of um, a, share of devolution, a share of VAT um, uh, to the Scottish Government, because um, to devolve VAT um, would be um, unlawful in EU law, each member state being required to set only one rate of sales or consumption tax. Um, as we are leaving the European Union, um, have, what discussions have there been between uh, your officials and Treasury, or between yourself and Treasury ministers, about devolving VAT? Uh, we've, we've engaged in a range of matters, but not specifically um, uh, VAT, other than having made the point around 
uh, more widely on the impact that VAT has had, uh, say, on tourism or hospitality or refurbishment of properties. So it's been part of the much uh, wider uh, discussion uh, on uh, VAT, and of course, including the emergency services as well. So that's where my engagement has been largely around VAT. The December called Scotland's Place in Europe, which included a quite lengthy chapter about additional devolution, but as I recall, it didn't say anything very much about VAT. Is that because you don't want VAT to be devolved? No, I'd be more than happy if the Scottish Government was able to have uh, control over VAT as well. I'm just telling you specifically what I've engaged with UK Government, as you asked, on VAT, which but was those other matters. Given that you want it to be devolved, why haven't you had any conversations with government, with UK Government about that in the nine, ten months since the EU referendum? As Adam Tompkins well knows, that we engage uh, with a maximalist position on the devolution of powers uh, to Scotland, but I've also accurately answered your question on what specific conversations I had with UK ministers on VAT, which was around emergency services, of course, uh, Scotland's emergency services having to pay for uh, VAT, not being able to reclaim that, which is a great loss to Scotland's emergency services, or other areas that would be supported in Scotland, uh, the other parts of the economy would be supported if we could uh, vary VAT rates. So of course we would support the devolution of VAT to Scotland, but you're also correct uh, that the, the, the deal that we're discussing here, the implementation of the Scotland Act powers, uh, was around that, as you have accurately described, an assignment uh, of a, a, a share of VAT, but based in estimates, it's not the devolution of the power, but it would not surprise Mr Tompkins to know that, of course, we would like that uh, economic leave and others to be transferred to Scotland. If we leave the European Union. When we leave the European Union. Under any there's circumstance. There's you see. <laughs> if we leave the European Union. Patrick. Um, <laughs> I, I was going to get there anyway, but since since uh, Adam has opened this up, I might as well um, sl slightly reverse the order of my questioning. Uh, I, I did, um, just before the, the, the meeting got underway, have a, a wee quick skim back over the, the Smith Commission final report. Uh, I, I do it every time I need a laugh. <laughs> and um, the, the, the report itself doesn't go into a great deal of detail about the rationale, about the reasons why what was being recommended was recommended. Uh, obviously, the European rules were part of the discussion. Um, but uh, I suppose at the time I made the argument that I was pretty unconvinced about the, the assignment of a proportion of a tax uh, because it doesn't actually give the Scottish Government or the Scottish Parliament any additional policy levers, any additional fiscal policy flexibility. Uh, since that time, has the government's thinking developed at all on whether there actually is any benefit to the Scottish government in policy terms of the assignment of a proportion of that? What's the point of it? I suppose uh, there's a point around um, more uh, accountability and that general economic growth and, and delivering more economic growth uh, being good for uh, the economy, uh, being able to estimate what's actually received uh, and Scotland contributes to um, public expenditure as well. But Mr Harvey is correct. We would rather have had, of course, uh, the devolution of the power uh, to be able to use it in a way that uh, supports the economy and have full transparency, accountability uh, and uh, command uh, uh, over that. Uh, but what is being implemented is what is agreed, uh, which is the assignment rather than devolution or control uh, of VAT. So it achieves greater accountability in terms of one part of government policy, economic growth, uh, but no relevance at all to other, econ other parts of government policy. Well, I'm, I'm making the point that that's uh, one benefit of having that uh, assignment based on estimates, albeit uh, in Scotland, but I'm in agreement with Patrick Harvey, it would be better to have devolution and control of VAT because it would be used in a way that supports uh, uh, the Scottish economy and as part of a range of tools that the Scottish Government would have to, um, to direct uh, our economy and our fiscal decisions in a more appropriate way. I'd rather not be able to determine the tax, uh, but simply um, receive what's, what's estimated to be our share of it within Scotland. So if nothing else changes, uh, the, the, the assignment of this large uh, chunk of, of VAT uh, raised in Scotland 
and the block grant adjustment taking that money back again. If nothing else changes, it doesn't really affect the Scottish budget. It only affects the Scottish budget if there are changes over time, uh, either in the amount of VAT that's raised in Scotland, uh, or if there are errors in the methodology that's used to, to calculate it. Can I ask you, if the approach to the methodology is not really a fundamental change, it's, it's, a, it's trying to get more accurate, at, roughly speaking, the, the current approach, uh, is there any potential consequence of taking as the baseline year uh, a year in which, for example, the UK's future relationship with Europe becomes clear uh, in the publication of a, uh, a Brexit deal and that there are economic consequences which affect the amount of VAT that's raised in that year? Is there a, a danger in taking that kind of potentially turbulent year as the baseline? Okay, I'll ask Aidan to cover that uh, particular scenario in as fair a way as possible. <laughs> yeah, so um, the key thing is, is, again, it's working through the block grant adjustment. So it's always about the performance relative to the rest of the UK. So, so long as that, so long as there was um, a, a shock, if you like, um, an economic shock from any, any particular reason, as long as that affected both the rest of the UK and Scotland equally, then there wouldn't necessarily be um, a particular impact on Scotland. If it was diversion, if it was a different type of shock, then that, that would be a consideration in terms of when the baseline would be set. Um, so these, the, these are the sorts of issues that we need to be very clear on agreeing, because as you say, on the one hand, it's sort of, it, could be t it could be quite straightforward in terms of methodology, but actually there's some quite fundamental issues around all of this in terms of actually agreeing the final um, set of arrangements with um, Treasury um, about how this will work forward and, and indeed advising um, Mr Mackay on that um, and, as, as well. And given the concern about uh, one industry, tourism, which has already been flagged up as particularly significant in Scotland as a, as a source of uh, VAT being raised here, which we haven't yet got a methodology for counting, uh, there is the potential uh, for that kind of asymmetric consequence. Um, if, if there was volatility year to year, and I think that's partly why they're getting it up and running, getting the transition years in place, give us a good indication of the extent to which there is volatility. So have you, have there. you confirmed yet which years those will be? Um, we haven't. And when Speakers. do we expect to know? Um, it, it, so um, we've got a um, um, a jack plan for the summer. Sorry? So, so a joint the joint ex a committee joint for the summer, which will be informed by the joint working of officials. I, th I think... And you would expect that meeting to make the decision about the timetable? Not necessarily. Um, there isn't very long to go. No, but I, but I, I think the point that you're raising is a, a valid one around uh, the baseline and the methodology and then potentially impacting on, on that for all future years and where the baseline is set, particularly at point in, in the economic cycle. So... Um, I think it's a you know it's a fair point to make to consider what we say as the baseline, the start position, and the methodology. Um, Mr. Harvey makes a very valid point around what that would mean going forward, depending on where we are in an economic cycle. So that's part of the consideration as well as seen through the spirit of uh, the agreement. I mean, we are we are talking about a block grant adjustment that's almost half the size of the income tax one. Is that right? Is that roughly where we're at? And we're already concerned about uh, potential inaccuracies in terms of counting income taxpayers. If there was any kind of ambiguity or inaccuracy, either in the methodology or a, a, a similar uh, concern as a result of when this is implemented, uh, we'd be talking about a very substantial roll of the dice in terms of future Scottish budgets. No, I think that's exactly why we have to be absolutely sure in the methodology, but also the point in the economic cycle that we set as the baseline going forward. And uh, Mr Harvey touched on, on the Brexit issue. We know that the, the independent analysis um, is that there will be an economic uh, impact uh, on uh, GDP, on, on tax receipts, on inflation. Now, we can't forecast exactly what that looks like, but it will have an important uh, impact nonetheless. So I think it's a valid point. Uh, to be clear on the benchmark point uh, and the methodology to ensure that we don't disadvantage uh, Scotland's budget. Thank you. I like your tongue in cheek. It does make big, big, big the question of detriment applies. No detriment applies to Brexit or not. But <laughs> <laughs> That's an exam question. I think, even I wouldn't say. I think, I think, uh, I think convener, there were known knowns and known unknowns, and then there was Brexit. Um,
Ash, you would deal with issues around the Scotland Reserve. Yes. Um, so in paragraph 72 of the Scottish Government report, I'll just read it out. You said that detailed arrangements for um, reporting and repaying borrowing and the operation of the Scotland Reserve are being, or the process is being agreed at the moment with the UK government. So I'm just wondering, um, do you know at the moment whether or when the arrangements will be agreed or are you able to sort of put that on the record now? Yeah, I, I can cover what's happened in terms of you know, actual practice around budget and we understand what what our borrowing limits are, we understand what um, uh, the uh, Scotland Reserve should look like. Um, of course, there was the issue where uh, financial year we, we generate more tax than we had anticipated. We put that in the cash reserve, but we understand uh, what our limits are. As to um, borrowing decisions specifically for capital, they'll be taken for um, the financial year. We're currently in much uh, later in the year, but, but Aidan can go through some of the, uh, the detail. But that's where the budgetary position is and the functions that we've currently executed uh, and the decisions that we'll take uh, going forward. Um, again, from a budget point of view, we don't have any plans um, to uh, use uh, uh, resource uh, borrowing, but Aidan can say more. Yes, yeah, so, so I suppose the final range is more, more the technical details, as, as Mr Mackay set out. You know, the high-level principles uh, are all there in terms of the caps, the annual caps, um, the aggregate caps on capital and resource. Um, some of this agreement is more about the precise um, application of those. Um, so, for example, things like you know the rolling four-year period of economic shock. How do we define that exactly? Um, these sorts of things. Um, still, so it's when you get into the detail, just agreeing all of those so that we're all on the same page in terms of future arrangements. Um, but the high level, we're not, we're not, there's no doubt about that, you know, the high level agreement stands. So if the detailed arrangements are not yet fully agreed, um, I'm just wondering what sort of scope there would be for this committee to scrutinise those sort of details when, they're, when they are agreed. Well, we can return to uh, the committee when, when each of these uh, elements are uh, agreed. If, if that's helpful, and particularly I, on the intergovernmental uh, relations uh, report to the committee, what engagement I've had with UK government, so we would normally inform the committee of that. That's true. So we can return um, on what has been agreed, and then the committee can choose what it wants to probe further. Thank you. Neil, I think you do some issues around general economic issues on this. We just touched on it there, but um, in terms of obviously, we, we're all aware that economic performance relates to, to revenues in, in, in future years. Um, but latest economic growth figures show that uh, growth in the rest of the UK has been higher than uh, than in Scotland. Do you envisage that trend continuing? And if so, are you concerned for uh, revenues in Scotland as a result of that? Well, of course, we want to support the uh, economy, encourage uh, economic growth and GDP growth and you know, I don't necessarily want to rehearse all the politics, but we know that Fraser of Allender Institute identified um, Brexit um, as an issue. There's an issue around uh, consumer confidence. There are um, clear challenges in the North East around uh, oil and gas downturn. Uh, and that includes the supply chain uh, onshore. That said, we've been strong in terms of productivity on unemployment, uh, female employment, youth unemployment. Uh, uh, so there are many positives as well, and we've had a strong record in foreign direct investment, and we're doing more around that uh, uh, in terms of our uh, uh, strategy on uh, recalibrating our economic strategy and internationalisation and so on. So there's a range of actions underway to support uh, the economy as well as uh, the infrastructure spend and you know, a whole host of other actions. Uh, of course, we'd be concerned that the last quarter's uh, GDP stats, we'll hear the, the next quarter's uh, stats in uh, early uh, summer, but f from my point of view, the budget has made a, a number of positive investments to support the economy, and uh, we want to uh, continue uh, with that. But as I say, we've got a high level of uh, employment and a uh, low level of uh, unemployment, but the challenges to Scotland's economy, I think, have in large measure been down to uh, oil and gas. Now there are some signs of a, a recovery and uh, a growth uh, opportunities there and hopefully that will help uh, uh, with the uh, figures going forward. 
Uh, okay, thank you, Cabinet Secretary and official for coming along today and giving us uh, uh, evidence on the reports. Uh, the next meeting of the committee will address stage two of the Air Departure Tax Scotland Bill. I now close this meeting. Thank you. <laughs>